discussion. And uh, I'll come back just at the very end to say a few more. Thank you very much. I'm delighted that we managed to drag you in off the kind of thrumming dance floor um, of outside. We'll only keep you for about half an hour or so. I should say, by the way, if anyone, you might be poised at the edge in case you want to go out and get another beer, but there are three or four seats in the front if anyone wants to come and sit down. Um, so, yeah, we're delighted to be here, um, mostly in celebration of uh, your fantastic new canvas and also in celebration, as Anne said, of the new monograph which just came out last month on Mark and his work. Um, and I suppose the first thing I wanted to ask you, Mark, is um, that actually for me, even though I've known you for a little while and known your work for a lot longer, actually seeing all of your work put into one place at one time made me realise well, exactly what the author Martin Herbert says very early on in the book, which is just quite the range of projects that you've worked on in the last 20 or 25 years. I mean, Anne mentioned some of them there, including the TARDIS and F.A. Homo, but just to give you a slight flavour for those who, some of you will know Mark's work well, and even if you don't, this gives something of a flavour. You've uh, taken a photograph of yourself dressed up in a drag as a suffragette jockey. Uh, you've done a nighttime performance dressed as a bear in the Berlin Museum, which we'll see uh, some images of uh, a little bit later. You have uh, exhibited the gushing hose pipe, which was sticking through the front uh, window of a gallery. Uh, you've made a series of technically brilliant oil paintings of uh, horses and jockey silks. You have most recently marked hundreds, thousands of bricks across London, which some of you may have spotted, uh, with uh, Mark's kind of tag, if you like, which is uh, in fact something that translated into the book's uh, jacket design. So if you see something that looks like that on the brick in London, this is the man who's responsible. I mean, that just gives a very quick flavour of the range of projects. And I suppose it makes me ask the question, what made some art wonder artwork in a way? I mean, it's a sort of, it's a big question to start off with. Mm. Uh, what do you see, I suppose, in a way, drawing together a lot of that practice? If anything, or is it I think it, I mean, it's, well, it's, it's, um, it's quite odd because as, as an artist, you, you, you follow your nose. That's kind of what you do. And, and, and so, in a way, I mean, I, I, I knew I had a certain set of concerns early on and, and that those could be best explored after a while through media other than painting. I mean, I, I, I went to Chelsea Art School where there was a painting department and a sculpture department and, and really not much more than that. And so, so those old kind of definitions were still there. And, but there was nothing doing in the painting department that really spoke to the modern world. I, me I remember going to the library and, and leafing through a copy of Art Forum, and there was a um, um, what's the name? Broken Plate Man, way back. Uh, yes. Charles. There was a Charles oh, painting in memoriam of Ian Curtis, and I remember thinking, <laughs> that, that can't be the Ian Curtis in Joy Division. There was this kind of disconnect. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? There was a kind of disconnect between the world of painting and, and art schools at that time and life as it was lived and, 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 and living in South London. And so, so actually, until I was at Goldsmiths and on the MA course there, there was actually no way in which I could put together the things that made any sense of the world in, in, in any proper, proper way. And, and, and by that point, it also kind of it made clear that sort of things to do with, yeah, Painting different media represented ways of exploring other areas and things that I was interested in, which seemed to be precluded by this rather prescriptive notion of, of art as, as it applied in, in, in art schools at that, that point. So, so I'm incredibly grateful for Goldsmith for that. And then, and then I suppose to have the, to think you can have the freedom to use those different media. I mean, I suppose that's a kind of temperamental. But it was only really when I uh, was asked to create a show for Hayward Touring Shows that I took a very self-conscious view back through my career because I think, I think well, if I have a theme, then I have to identify what it is as something to do in my own work. So it was only then that I started identifying things to do with thresholds and borders. And, um, that was a show 
can't believe any of you saw called the Russian Lines, which toured around the UK, but also came to the Haywood when four years ago or something. It was. So that was the first time you actually you looked back at your body. Yeah, I mean, I was kind of. I mean, I was. Yeah, I mean, I'm sort of obviously aware of what, where I was going, and after a while, you know, if if you've been making work that has had a certain amount of attention for a certain amount of time, then you have to have some relationship with that as well. So you can't, you know, it becomes an interesting dialogue with your own past, hopefully, it's not too stultifying. But at the same time, yeah, I think it's always the urge to make some, something new or something in, in new direction. Yeah, I mean, we've got up in front of us here, and actually, we have to the next one. I mean, this is an interesting way to start in a way, actually, it's like the slightly early work before that. But I mean, you were very much a keen to at the beginning of your career, I suppose, and an art school, essentially. Um, and this is a series, well, which maybe you can say a little bit about the Capitol, which was a series of seven, as you can see, very realistic paintings of what seemed to be homeless people. Yeah, I think, I mean, I I mean, there's various works I've made during Thatcher's reign, so, so to speak, but I mean, towards the end of it, there, there was a particularly stupid bit of legislation that, that cut off benefits to children, to children, or whatever, from, from 16 to 18 year olds who weren't living at home. So suddenly there were a lot of people living on the streets. There were other people living on the streets for various other reasons as well, but as a, as a result of that, Policies, but they were always treated as. I mean, there, there was a sort of journalese that, 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 that this subject matter attracted. There were the inevitably kind of black and white, grainy pieces about people living on the street. And they only ever had their first names, and, and, and in a way, they, they were doing them a really disservice, almost than the Thatcher and the social services, because they were, in a way, well, it was, it was Darwinian, really, yeah, in, in that there was some sense that somehow they, they deserved it. And so, the, so this was a kind of attempt to turn the language around and use the sort of, sort of language of sort of swagger portraiture or, or boardroom. Kind of, yeah, the old, the old portrait is something significant for people who, who don't have that, who, who are disenfranchised. And, on the street, but the same, for the same token, I knew that I couldn't do that to a, to a real homeless person, and, and because it was really about a battle for representation that, that I and my abused friends and colleagues uh, masquerading as
So I went in a passport booth and, and took these photographs and then just drew on them with felt tip pens, really. And, and I don't know. I, 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 yeah, I mean, I hope it kind of. That was interesting that you see it as, I mean, it's an early work. In some ways, as I said, it's quite a slight and quite quick idea. But you obviously. Yeah, but I mean, there's, I suppose, the, you know, there's words like deface that kind of come to mind. There's something kind of violence to my own image here, which, I mean, I think. Perhaps the best of my work is where I feel a little endangered about what I'm doing or, or that I'm crossing some sort of line. And, and this is quite an odd thing to do to one's self image, I suppose. So, so, so that's. Um, I think that's interesting. Is that crossing usually a personal line of some sort, or it could be a projection? Or just, or, or, or just crossing a sort of or, side line. Or, 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 or just, yeah, feeling just a little bit unsafe or endangered about something or, or, or there's a certain kind of a certain kind of ambiguity that is put to my work which um, is to do with something teetering between one reading or something or another or, or something that actually presents enough of the things to then kind of give to the viewer the responsibilities for, for completion or for which way they're going to jump or yeah, I mean, it seems to me back to that question of what is a hot moment of work. That to me, there's always some sort of free somewhere. There's some kind of slightly uncomfortable or unexpected kind of jarring. And very often, two things. Quite often, many, many more as well, as we'll see. Um, now, I mean, I've talked a bit about painting. One of your major subjects, which we'll move on to, Anna, is. Um, or which was a very major subject of yours for many, many years, was connected to horses and horse racing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which again, is, to some extent, a slightly unexpected subject for you know, a contemporary artist working in the last decade or two. So tell us a bit about why, where the fascination came from, and what, what drove this big series of work. I mean, yeah, I mean, I suppose horse racing was a, a, a private passion of mine, but after a while, you know, uh, Is that you've grown up around or knowing? Or you just got into no, I just got. I, no, it's one of those unaccountable things you get into um, when you're too young to know why. So, um, you know, no one told me it was boring, so I kind of got into it. Right. And um, <laughs> I, um, um, but but it, it, you know, it, it's interesting for lots of reasons to do with <coughs> society and so, so so a lot of the work I was making in the eighties. I felt somehow, in a way, the racing world uh, provided a, a kind of structure. There was a kind of, um, uh, you know, all the kind of class relations, the uh, obsession with origins, the, the uh, you know, th those things could, could be flagged up here, but at the same time, yeah, you know, there's a genuine awe and, and fascination for the, for the beauty of these animals that. We've had a large part in, in creating as well. Um, and a huge nature culture. So yeah, so there's things. that, and yeah, and then there's the kind of fact that they were produced from three imported Arab standard drug about 1700, and Sheikh Mohammed was busy trying to buy back the breed and, and build, build. So, so there's a sort of post colonial thing going on as well. But it, but it you know, it, 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 it was, it was, how, much, how much of that thinking, sorry to interrupt, but how much of that thinking comes for you after the event in a way? Because you said it was a, I don't know if you meant Charles, but did yeah. that. But I mean, it was, it was a sort of youthful passion of yours. But presumably at that stage you weren't thinking about Arabian horse studs and the geopolitics mm. and I don't know. No, no, but I was, I was kind of aware of those things. And I think, I think, I mean, I think the sort of racing works were probably a, a a more self-conscious episode in my career in which I, I could see a way within lots of strands to racing that I could do, deal with identity and, and nationality and, and class and lots of other things that, that I've been dealing with in, in the ages. but this, this provided a sort of a, a framework, so yeah. And it culminated, um, this sort of serious, Massive interest in yours through your work in uh, horses and horse riding and the whole culture. In the actual purchase of a, a horse, you named a real work of art. 
fixture in the square. So things changed after that. But I, you know, I always feel I should say that because that was the intent of which this was made. Do you feel you've done something quite different? How do you know it was a temporary mm. project? Well, I don't, that's hypothetical, but I mean, but, but back then that was, you know, and, and so, and it, yeah, this idea was pretty much instant, I must admit, and, and I think it was because uh, we were approaching the millennium and everyone was a little bit um, queasy about mentioning the fact that it was about 2,000 years since the birth of Christ, and, and we had this empty dome in, 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 in Greenwich, and no one could kind of go near it. So it was very old. Well, the thing is, like watching the knobs go over on a you know, mileometer or something, you know, and, and you know, I mentioned Christ really. So, and I thought, well, Trafalgar Square, that's the place of the crowd, of the mob, it's kind of where Charles I was executed. It, it, it's, you know, and, and so it kind of, it just came to me that, and especially with the recent history of the former Yugoslavia and our kind of rather. Um, Reactions to that, which was a kind of, you know, in a way, a religious war that we didn't understand. But, you know, that, that I was thinking, well, you know, if, if Christ was anything, he was a, you know, he was a religious leader. He had occupied land. Um, if he was sent out before the mob, and you know, then that's us in the square. What would we then you know? So, and then the life size thing that seems to be quite an easy decision against the overstep. <coughs> Bronzes in the square, and so yeah, it was like um, it sort of fell into place, but then actually, you know, really stupid things happened like the letter uh, saying that I was going to be the first on the plinth, it didn't, didn't get to me until nine months later, and <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, yeah, not quite a smooth thing. No, no, uh, well, as I should say, with many public commissions, and one of the lovely things that we have managed to include in the book is a lot of Mark's unrealised projects as well. It's quite a brave thing to, to expose in the book because these are, you know, to some extent, can be seen as the failures, the things that you pitch forward and get.